Okay, and we're back, ready to continue ranking the Mass Effect 2 missions. Wait, did Bernard leave during the break? It appears so. Hold on, he left me a DM. Bernie says he has to go, something about the arrival and that they're coming. I don't know what he's talking about. The arrival of what, his third heart attack? Doesn't matter, now put dossier tally in B tier now that the party pooper is gone. He also asked me not to let Joe and Donald do anything stupid with the tier list. Who does that motherfucker think he is? Regardless, I'll honor Bernie's request and leave Tali's recruitment mission in C tier. And now we begin with the loyalty missions. Let's start with Miranda, the prodigal. You sure you want to talk about Miranda, Barack? Isn't Michelle there right now? I'm fine, I just need to not vocalize all my intrusive thoughts. In this mission, Miranda requests us to help her relocate her sister Oriana and her family because Miranda's hyper-controlling father has tracked her down. It starts with no BS. We drive in and we're immediately met with a bunch of Eclipse mercenaries who try to stop us and we quickly show them why that was a mistake. I think this mission did a lot for Miranda's character. Before this, Miranda openly stated she didn't trust Shepard at all, to the point that she wanted to implant a control chip in us. And the only reason she didn't is because the elusive man apparently stopped her. And that does reflect itself at the start of the mission, since Miranda omitted to tell us that Oriana is her little sister and that she was the one who took her from Henry Lawson. Though to be clear, Miranda took Oriana for a good reason. Still, this underlines the one flaw Miranda has that keeps her from being perfect otherwise. She never puts her trust in anyone and is too secretive. She hid relevant information from Shepard, which turned out fine. But because she refused to tell Nickett the entire story, he ended up double-crossing Miranda and assisted her father. Miranda also spends about half of the mission coping when we realize Nickett has probably betrayed her. The girl wouldn't wake up to reality. This mission gets a little creative with the combat terrain, and it's a welcome change compared to just straight paths. Some areas have conveyor belts that will block your shots, but they also provide moving cover for you. You can abuse conveniently placed explosive containers and there are pits on the floor to pull enemies into as the biotic classes. We catch up with Nickett, and behold, he's a filthy rat, but I can't blame a guy for taking what he described as a great deal of money from Henry Lawson. That's an easy W. Well, it would be, but Nickett doesn't get to enjoy it because either Miranda or Enyala executes him. Extra points if you bring Jack on the mission because she'll enjoy Enyala making fun of Miranda's less conservative Cerberus outfit and asking Shepard if we're still recruiting. That's comical coming from Jack who walks around wearing nothing but tattoos and some belt straps to cover her titties. We have a firefight with Enyala and her goons. Save Oriana, and then you can choose to let Miranda talk to her or just leave. It's a pretty basic premise, but the loyalty mission is vital to Miranda's character because without it, she has no depth whatsoever. And securing Miranda's loyalty is required if you want to keep her alive through Mass Effect 3. I think it's a mid-mission. It lacks any good atmosphere. It's just another fight on Ilium. Even if Miranda is a 10 out of 10, her loyalty mission is probably a C tier. It's a bitter pill to swallow, but I agree Miranda's mission is C tier. Now we're moving on to another loyalty mission. Let's do Jacob the Gift of Greatness. Well, it's a Jacob mission, so I'm sure there won't be much debate on this one, so why don't we all answer simultaneously? It's A tier. F -tier. I'm sorry, did someone just say it's A tier? It wasn't me. Hear me out. Nah, you gotta be kidding no me. No fucking way, bro. Barack, we slander Jacob. I'm more boring than a rabbit turd tailor in this Discord server. This is a Joe Biden level L from you, Barack. I'm surprised. Gentlemen, you must understand that Jacob's loyalty mission is a pretty good mission. Have you lost your damn mind? Okay, Donald, let's chill and hear Barry out. All right, this mission is actually expertly crafted. So much so that you nearly forget it has to do with Jacob. You're going to the planet Aea to search for the Hugo Gernsback, the ship Jacob's father served on because an SOS has been sent after 10 years since the frigate went missing. I'll say I'm glad the mission does something different and puts us in an outdoor environment in nature. Only seeing the inside of factories and warehouses got old quickly. The first part of this mission starts amazingly, setting up the atmosphere of a place where things have obviously gone awry. You listen to the audio logs and hear an officer talking about what they've done to the crew and their condition. The man mentions bruises, and the people forget about them after you distract them for two minutes. I always skip Jacob's loyalty mission, so I haven't a clue where this is going. If you speak to the beacon, it tells us that it was paused by Jacob's father over eight years ago. 
As you listen to more logs on the ruined ship, you hear a woman falling to mental decay caused by the local plants and another much more disturbing log that I think we'll refrain from going into detail on. As I recall, we run into a woman who is clearly not all there mentally. Like you have room to talk about someone's mental capacity. We save this survivor from the men who seemingly become feral after eating the local flora. Moving forward, we find a camp filled with nothing but women. And now you have my attention. We get a journal of what occurred on Aya. Ronald Taylor restricted the ship's food for himself and the other officers so they could stay sane so that the beacon could be repaired. Some mutinied over the decision, resulting in a casualty list after Ronald Taylor and the officers turned the mechs on them. A tough but understandable decision, Lord of the Flies type situation. It gets worse. The beacon was fixed after a year, but more casualties appeared, more incidents and brutal punishments. The members of the crew that fell to the decay were treated like toys, and the male crew members were flagged as exiled or dead, and the women were, to put this lightly, given to the male officers. Then the officers appeared in the casualties list, too. Ronald Taylor took full control of the situation and let things continue until he needed saving. What in the fuck? Who wrote this dark-ass story in my Mass Effect game? Jacob is not half bad in his mission. I'd say he's kind of interesting during it. Jacob resolves to find Ronald Taylor and set things right. As you move toward Taylor, he is constantly lying about the state of affairs. And when you meet him, he keeps going on and on about how everyone went crazy and locked him up in his hiding place. I remember this. Bro will not own up to anything he's allowed to happen. He's a genuinely reprehensible character. We put Ronald Taylor in the worse than Jacob tier for a reason. This mission has three ways you can deal with Taylor. You can send him to prison for 10 years for each year of what he did. You can leave him to get sorted out by the hunters. Or, and this is my favorite, hand him a half-charged pistol and tell him to kiss himself. Okay, Barack, I heard you out, it's F-tier. You gotta be kidding me. It's all fine and dandy that Jacob's loyalty mission is well written. I'll admit the atmosphere is great and Jacob is almost interesting during it. However, this mission does not impact Jacob's character. He starts the mission believing his father is dead and ends the mission still thinking his father is dead. Nothing changed. Jacob goes back to being the same boring guy he always was. His loyalty mission also has no impact in the story either. We are legit just running an errand. I'll amend my original stance. Jacob's loyalty mission may not be important overall, but it's still decent. I'll give it C tier. Also, it does have some impact on him. In Mass Effect 3, Jacob says he wants to be there for Bryn and their baby. He at least wants to do better than his own dad. Oh, please, Jacob couldn't go six months before cheating on female Shepard. I doubt he's gonna wait nine months for Bryn, let alone 18 years for their kid. I'll be fair and consider your stances. Jacob's loyalty mission averages out to a C tier. Once again, the game will require us to hit up a main story mission. The elusive man pulls us aside to tell us that a Turian ship disabled a collector vessel and we're tasked with boarding it to find information on crossing the Omega-4 relay. Holy fucking shit, this mission is the mother of all difficulty spikes. I will agree with Joe on this one. The collector vessel is insanely difficult for how early you acquire it. We'll get to that later. In this mission, we learn something harrowing. Edie finds the genetic structure of the collectors is similar to that of the Protheans. The Reapers have repurposed this long dead race into our enemies. It's a big reveal. This is as close to the Reapers being a major threat as we get in the main story of Mass Effect 2. And this provides detail of how the Reapers wage war on the galaxy by turning our own people against us. As you move deeper into the Collector Vessel, you find a massive chamber of pods, so many that your squad will theorize that the Collectors will eventually target Earth itself. We get to a control panel and access their data banks, but it's a trap. And now we prepare for one of the most brutal fights in the trilogy. This battle is a motherfucker. Multiple platforms containing collector troops, Praetorians, and Harbinger come after us. Hold up, Donald. Those things that send shockwaves out at us are scions. The Praetorian is the flying creature we fight on Horizon. You and Bernie incorrectly named it. My bad, both the enemies are equally annoying, so I got them mixed up. This gauntlet will give you trouble because the scion and Harbinger can force you out of cover, leaving you open to the collector troops. It can be annoying but it's honestly a good challenge. Careful placement of your squad will help you succeed. When you finally make it through the battle, we learn that the Turian signal that we responded to was fake and that the elusive man would never fall for such an obvious bait. 
He lured us here on purpose. You can elevate this moment by bringing Miranda along, who will deny that the elusive man really tricked us, showing that she still trusts him, but that her belief may be wavering a little. Then the collector vessel starts powering up, and now we need to get the hell out of here before we end up getting harvested. The music and atmosphere of this escape is peak. The collector troops are always used expertly, and this mission is no exception. Very true, Donald. The tension on this mission is unmatched. A Praetorian shows up to mess with us while some husks also show up. The collectors are throwing everything they can to stop us. After a final push through some more husks, we make it to our shuttle and narrowly escape before the collector vessel powers up. This was a well-needed mission after spending time recruiting squad mates and doing loyalty missions. This reminded us what we're really doing out here in the Terminus system and why the collectors are such a threat. The collector vessel mission should go in A tier. It's challenging, has numerous dynamic battlefields, throws a wider variety of enemies, provides world building, and as a bonus, it unlocks advanced training so we can pick up improved weaponry. This mission saved the mid-game of Mass Effect 2 from being just a slog of recruitment and loyalty missions. Now we return to our loyalty mission bonanza with Jack Subject Zero. After going through the Cerberus logs, Jack has relocated the facility she was tortured in, and she wants to go there and blow up the place. It's a simple premise, but with character writing, we get the full details of what made Jack the way she is. Just like with Caden, Jack was forced to endure harsh training and torture because people believed that's how you improved someone's biotic potential. Jack was also conditioned to fight and to enjoy it. If she didn't hesitate, she would be filled with narcotics. An interesting point came up here. Apparently, the facility was operating without the elusive man's knowledge. Miranda will point out that the place seemingly went rogue if you brought her with you. Of course, Jack-o'-lantern isn't interested in listening. As we explore, we learn things didn't go down quite as Jack described. First, the other kids at the facility were used as guinea pigs for the experiments. They bore the worst of it so Jack wouldn't die. As Aresh tells us, the riot at Telton was started when all of the other kids attacked at once. And then Jack got loose, starting her rampage. For a character with such a short introduction, Aresh is interesting in the way he serves as a parallel to Jack. Jack returns to Teltin to destroy it all and rid herself of all her bad memories of the place. But Aresh wants to restart the facility to find out what was learned and justify all the suffering he went through. Both Jack and Aresh are coping just in their own way. Jack isn't having any of that though and decides that Aresh has to go. Rather, you can either talk Jack into letting Aresh go or order her to execute him. I'm not sure what to make of this choice, to be honest. No matter what you choose, Jack will mellow out and become a teacher in Mass Effect 3. You'd think allowing her to indulge in her murderous tendencies would create a different path for her. Regardless of your choice, you take a walk with Jack, exploring her old room, a nice little moment letting her reminisce about her time there, like how her desk was her best friend and how she killed her first man to escape. Once all is settled, you return to the shuttle and light the Telton facility like the 4th of July. If you let Aresh go, do you think he manages to outrun the blast? It's not like we checked to see if he actually left. I'm gonna go ahead and guess not. Anyway, I would put Jack's loyalty mission in D tier. Bro, what are you saying right now? Jack's mission is S tier. It does excellent character building and gives us more background into Cerberus. And Aresh is a pretty good NPC character. Joe, you said yourself the final choice of the mission doesn't have much impact on Jack's character development. No matter what you pick, you follow the same path. What's the point of indulging in her killer instinct if she will become a goody-good teacher regardless? Donald has a point there, and Jack's loyalty mission is pretty uninteresting. The challenge isn't there. And as neat as Jack's backstory is, it is unimportant to the overall story. I think D tier is a little harsh. We should put it in B tier. I think the parallel drawn between Aresh and Jack saves it from being mid. Y'all are wildin' out right now. I'll make my own tier list and set this straight myself. Of course, you two would like a mission that involves dropping a bomb on something. Newsflash, all the kids at the Telton facility are already dead. Very funny, Donald, but we're moving on. Time to do Morden Old Blood. Morden has asked us to help him rescue his student Malon from Krogan Clan Warlock on Tuchanka. When you get to the hospital, you're confronted with a Krogan clan speaker. And let me tell you something, the emphasis is on speaker, 
This motherfucker rambles on and on about the revenge the Blood Pack will do to the galaxy and how tales of their destruction will echo on forever. Like, bro, shut up. Shorten this to 20 words or less. Another one of those renegade interactions I have no issue taking. The measly four Paragon points you get are not worth listening to this dude yelling an average Japanese light novel title's worth of words. Once you get past them, you explore the hospital and conversate with Morden about his work on the Genophage modification. Analyzing Morden's viewpoint on this, he views his modification as something as mundane as gardening, like he's clearing weeds. Morden has managed to remove all moral responsibility he has for the state of the Krogan. He's not responsible. The Krogan brought the genophage on themselves, and Morden's simulations indicated that without the modification, all-out war would have begun. An interesting viewpoint, Joe, given how much you simp for Bakara. This dude will defend the genophage, which causes Krogan women to experience the deaths of thousands of unborn Krogan babies, but then get angry with me because I don't like Turians because they launched an unprovoked attack on humanity. There's plenty of good reason for the genophage, Donald. Well, Morden might begin to disagree with you, Joe, as the loyalty mission continues, we encounter a female Krogan that died trying to cure the genophage. When Shepard presses Morden on his genophage work this time, he's no longer so calm and cool about it. He blatantly denies the damage his work caused. Morden even admits to having a crisis of faith after dropping the modification and turning to the Wheel of Life, a Solarian concept similar to Hinduism. A break from all the serious stuff, we run into a Krogan weakened by all the experiments run on him. Shepard can give the guy a pep talk, claiming he's acting like a Quarian with a tummy ache. Tally will take offense to that. We finally make it to Melon, and it turns out he wasn't forced to work with the blood pack. He's trying to cure the genophage of his free will. Good God, Bioware really said, let's take a Solarian who are already infamous for being nerdy dorks and gave one of them that invader Zim-ass sounding voice. Malin goes into detail as to why he's done this. He believes that the genophage caused the cultural genocide of the Krogan. Men fight over fertile females, and when they can't have children, the males leave to fight and die for credits as mercenaries, just as Rex did not to mention the untold physical and mental damage this must do to Krogan females. Of course, this is all supposition on Malin's part. Morden will continue to point out all their data pointed toward another galactic war. And to be fair, Morden is right. Without a leader like Rex and Bakara at the helm, the Krogan would have invaded again. After we finish talking, Morden does something that finally made me grow respect for him. He aims to kill Malon. Either stopping or allowing Morden to kill Malin has some significance here. Morden has spent this entire mission being adamant about the fact that he's not a murderer. Yet here he is, about to execute a fellow scientist in cold blood. Morden not being a murderer is some BS. The first thing we're told about him is that he's as likely to shoot someone as he is to heal them. I still chose to spare Malin. His experiments are cruel and his viewpoint is slanted but he doesn't deserve to die for trying to end the suffering of the Krogan. Malin leaves, and now we get to one of the most vital decisions in the trilogy. Will you keep Malin's data, or will you destroy it? As you all know, Morden will cure the genophage regardless of the data, but if you destroy it, Bakara will die, and her death could have some serious ramifications down the line if you happen to have killed Rex in Mass Effect 1. You'll end up leaving Erdnot Reeve in charge, and that's not good, to put things lightly. Once you make your choice, the mission ends. Morden's mission isn't exactly the best loyalty mission in terms of gameplay or atmosphere, but things about it undeniably make it A-tier. It is vital to the overall plot, as it impacts the Tuchanka arc of Mass Effect 3. It begins Morden's development in seeing the wrongs of the genophage, also allowing the player to see the systemic damage it caused. No doubt a lot of the loyalty missions come off like we're just running errands for our friends, and while that's nice, it's better if these assignments actually have to do with stopping the Reapers, either directly or indirectly. Since we're on Tuchanka now, let's pivot right into Grunt's loyalty mission, which takes place on the planet. It's called Grunt Rite of Passage. Sweet baby Grunt is starting to go through puberty, and it's making him violent, well, more violent, and we're going to get him some help. Just get the boy some magazines and a bottle of Jergens, and lock him in his room for an hour. What the f***, Joe? Yeah, seriously, Joe, a magazine? You stuck in the year 1973 or something? The hub is free! I'm getting us off this topic. Grunt's loyalty mission starts with all dialogue, giving us insight into Krogan culture. When Krogans become adults, 
they undergo the rite of passage. Doing this will provide Grunt a place in the Krogan, allowing him to stand with Clan Erdnot. Talking to the Krogan on this mission cemented my love for them. The conversation with the shaman is fun. Putting that Varen Uvenk in his place with a headbutt is an amazing renegade interrupt. You know that gave Shepard whiplash. No way they headbutt a Krogan and didn't feel it. Now we move on to the best part of the mission, the rite of passage itself, a combat gauntlet where you battle against Varen, Clixon, and a goddamn Thresher Maul. Donald, you hated Garrus's recruitment mission for being one where you hold up and shoot in a singular place. How can you like grunts? Anything with grunt in it is automatically better than Garrus. Plus, the variety of enemies in the right far surpasses what's in the Archangel mission. There is also something about the atmosphere of this mission. Being alone out in the wilds of Tuchanka with nothing but its wildlife coming at us. And while the fighting can get a bit dull, the significance of defeating a Thresher Maw on foot can't be understated. No one has done it since Rex. After the right, Uvenk shows up and starts glazing my boy up. Unfortunately for him, it takes a bit more than pretty words to appease Grunt. So after Uvenk is dead, we meet back up with the Shaman, where Grunt is officially inducted into Clan Erdnot. Grunt's mission may not be the best, but it's essential to Grunt's personal journey. We help him find a place to call home, and this mission does determine Grunt's survival in Mass Effect 3. However, the combat is a bit long-winded. And one note, I would give it a B tier. My son deserves an S tier. It's C tier at best. The world building with the Krogan and its importance to Grunt shouldn't negate the fact that the main gameplay of this mission is just shooting for 10 minutes from a singular location, which isn't even that good. You legit either have to kill the Thresher Maw or wait five minutes for it to end. We're breaking even with B tier and moving on to Garrus I for an I. Garrus has tracked down Sidonis, the man who betrayed his squad and is seeking revenge. We go to the Citadel looking for a guy named Fade. We meet up with Avalis, who directs us to the real Fade, who is just Harkon, the guy from Korra's den who leads us to Garrus in Mass Effect 1. When we do eventually meet up with him, he hauls ass. And now we're chasing after Harkon through the Citadel warehouse, in stark contrast to Garrus's recruitment mission. Instead of being held up in one location, we're constantly moving to different areas, and our opponent is the one hiding. Garrus is finally being a bit interesting here. He's adamant in his desire to kill Sidonis and is willing to beat Harkin within an inch of his life to get his information. The way Garrus beat the piss out of Harkin was hilarious. He had it coming, not gonna lie. Bro disrespects female Shepard in Mass Effect 1. We head to Orbital Lounge, and before meeting with Sidonis, we have a rare moment. If you're trying to take the Paragon route, Shepard and Garrus will be at odds with each other for the first and only time in the story. About damn time this Turian grew a backbone. I think this is where the mission is at its best. It is easy to give Garrus what he wants and end the mission without any conflict. But if you try to rein him back in, you'll get more dialogue about Garrus. For Garrus, letting Sidonis get away with this is a gross injustice and nothing Shepard says will change his mind. However, if you let Sidonis talk, his words of guilt will get to Garrus. And it's lame. Leave it to Garrus to finally start becoming his own character to fumble at the last moment, ultimately. He goes into this entire thing with the desire to kill Sidonis, and he just gives it up. The mission ends with Garrus musing over seeing the world in black and white and being unable to handle all the gray. In the renegade outcome, Garrus shoots Sidonis, and he's ready to move on. Garrus' loyalty mission should go in D tier. It has no importance to the overall plot, and Garrus himself doesn't develop from the mission. The only way to get some extra depth out of him is on the Paragon path. Your hatred of Garrus has gone too far, Donald. No way are you saying we should put Garrus's loyalty mission lower than Jacob's. I'm with Donald here. Garrus's mission is just another one of those errands you run for your squad mates. And even in the conclusion, there's no character building for Garrus. Regardless of the outcome, Garrus thanks you for helping with Sidonis, and that's the end of it straight into D tier. Jesus fucking Christ. I thought the bad takes would end when Bernie left. I know you've seen the comments, Barack. The people believe Garrus is S tier and his loyalty mission should be higher. I love Garrus. He's a top companion and I'm always happy to see him in the game, but we can't pretend his character is anywhere near as complex as a lot of the other squad mates. And that bears itself in his loyalty mission. Next, we have Samara, the Ardat Yakshi. 
Now we're in the part where BioWare clearly ran out of time because this mission has no combat at all. I believe that's deliberate. Given the nature of the assignment, a big firefight would not make a lot of sense. We're going undercover on Omega to track down Morinth, the person Samara was looking for when we recruited her. Morinth is her Ardot Yakshi daughter, a serial killer with a genetic defect that makes the Asari melding process lethal. The highlight of this mission is doing crowd work to lure Morinth out to Shepard. By picking the right actions in the club, you'll get Samara's daughter to like Shepard as their next victim. You can pick up some extra dialogue options by listening to Neff's journal and talking to people in the club, allowing you to trick Morinth easily. It's ironic. Morinth has gotten by for centuries by manipulating people into sleeping with her so she can kill them. But here she is falling for the exact same tricks at the hands of Shepard. That's how you know Shepard has that dog in him. When you're with Morinth in her apartment, you can technically fall for her charms if your morality isn't high enough. But Samara will show up for you before Morinth gets you. Then, oh yeah, it's time for some Asari on Asari action, sweet home Alabama style. And then an interesting decision comes up. If you have the morality, you can help Morinth and kill Samara. Morinth will then begin impersonating Samara, and no one on the crew besides Kasumi will ever find out. And as I said in the squad mate tier list video, it isn't worth it. BioWare did not commit to making Morinth a full-blown squad mate. They legit write her out of the game until she reappears as a banshee on Earth. To be fair, Samara does say you'll regret your choice. Anyhow, I think this mission should go into F tier. The first part of it is all right, but it doesn't have much in the way of consequences. And a mission without combat needs to be heavy in the narrative department to make up for it. And Samara's loyalty mission doesn't meet the bar. Sorry, Samami. Now we're going to skip Tally's mission and come back to it later. Next up is Thane Sins of the Father. Another no combat mission, we're on the Citadel trying to help Thane track down his son Kolyat, who has turned to a life of crime as an assassin. Now this mission has some great moments. First, you can find this kid named Mouse, who you can interrogate for information. And Shepard goes on their demon arc and beats Mouse. Or you can be nice to the kid and he'll eventually come clean for Thane's sake. Mouse is also the source of the Shepard VI. That aside, Mouse tells us the guy Kolyat is working for is Elias Kellum, a new big shot on the Citadel. We work with Captain Bailey to get Kellum in a cell for more interrogation. This is a highlight of the mission. You can handle interrogating Kellum in a few ways. Shepard is the good cop and Thane is the bad cop, or vice versa. I'm fond of being the bad cop and beating the brain matter out of Kellum, but if you get your Spectre status back, you can just flex the fact that you're above the law and Kellum will immediately come clean. The quickest interrogation in history. You can also threaten to pardon my language, cut Kellum's balls off and sell them to a Krogan. A call back to something we're told in Mass Effect 1. Anyway, our target is a Turian politician named Joram Talid. And now we begin perhaps the least fun part of Mass Effect 2. No kidding, following Talid through the streets of the Citadel is just awful. There's no way around it. And if you don't do it, you'll fail the mission. The only thing saving this part of the mission is the run-in with the worker, giving us a funny renegade dialogue option. We catch up to Kolyat just as he begins his chase for Talid, and we corner them in an apartment. When we catch up, we can defuse the situation by shooting a lamp and punching Kolyat, allowing Talid to escape. Or, and this one is pretty crazy, show Kolyat he ain't shit and kill Talid ourselves. And now comes the actual impact of this mission, the dialogue between Thane and Kolyat. Mass Effect 2 is notorious for being a game where we're helping our squad mates with their daddy issues. In this particular case, Thane is the bad father. Kolyat is the one you sympathize with here. His mother died and his father was absent, which caused Kolyat to go down this path. After their heart-to-heart, -heart, Captain Bailey allows the father and son some time alone to reconcile. The mission ends with Bailey seeing if he can get Kolyat community service, despite his crimes being deserving of worse. I believe this to be a better version of Samara's mission. The emotional impact is present, and this begins Thane's rehabilitation, as this mission finally gets him to reconnect with his son. Put it in A tier, Thane's loyalty mission is well told and provides tons of depth into his character. I don't know, following Tay Lead is so unbelievably awful that if it weren't for the rest of the mission, it would go in F tier. I can't let that slide. However, this is probably the most emotionally driven loyalty mission, and for that, I think it can be at least B tier. I enjoy the renegade moments, and Bailey is pretty cool. I'm with Barack, put it in B tier. 
Time for the two DLC squad mates loyalty missions. We'll begin with Zaid, the price of revenge. Zaid first introduces this mission to us as a request to rescue the refinery workers from the Blue Suns. But Zaid's real objective is to get revenge on Vito, the man he founded the Blue Suns with. Zaid being related to the Suns is something that comes up if you bring him to meet with Tarek on Garrus's recruitment mission. But here we find out just how far it extends. I have to give Zaid some points. When the mission starts, he prioritizes accomplishing his goal of getting it back in blood and won't let Shepard stop them. He creates a fire with hopes of trapping Vito, and when he runs, we're tasked with chasing after Vito or stopping the fire to save the workers. This is one of those are we the baddies kinds of situations. None of these workers deserve to die, but we need to chase Vito to secure Zaid's loyalty. If you choose to pursue Vito, we run after him as the refinery explodes all around us, the sounds of the workers screaming as they burn and suffocate to death. It's a harrowing mission if you pick this path. Eventually, you'll catch up with Vito, and Zaid will give him a quick shot to the leg, then burn him alive. Alternatively, you can save the refinery workers, resulting in Vito escaping and Zaid being less than happy with us, causing you to fail the loyalty mission. Unless you have enough Paragon, that is, in which case, Zaid will see reason in Shepard's words and get over it, allowing you to secure his loyalty. I wonder if BioWare realized it was too much to make players kill innocent people to get a squad mate's loyalty. There's also another outcome that is pretty insane. If you don't do Zaid's mission until after the finale, you can leave him to burn in the fire he started. Zaid's loyalty mission is pretty good for a character that's otherwise subpar. The exploding refinery is a great place to fight in. The mission has multiple outcomes that can satisfy both Renegade and Paragon players. And Zaid is pretty dope in this mission. As Donald would say, he isn't just a follower of Shepard here. However, Vito is pretty uninspiring as a character, and ultimately this mission has no impact on anything at all. Stick it in C tier. I agree. As neat as the various outcomes are, it's still pretty mid. Now we move on to Kasumi's stolen memory. Oh, baby Kasumi, let's fucking go, brother. You could tell that Bioware put a lot more work into Kasumi's DLC than they did Zaid. It bears itself in the mission. We're helping Kasumi recover a gray box a device containing information about Kasumi's dead partner, Keiji Okuda. Please don't mention that name in my presence, Barack. You're cucked, Joe. You'll never romance Kasumi, Keiji One. She would rather be with his ghost in the synthesis ending than with you in 100 years. Fuck you, Donald. You really didn't hold back there. I may be a simp for the Asari, but even I think Joe is way too cringe with Kasumi. He'll get over it, carry on with the analysis, Barack. Kasumi's mission blends in some stealth with combat as we try to get into Donovan Hawk's vault to find the gray box. You investigate the vault and track down Hawk's DNA sample, get a voice sample, and shut down the power. What do you mean by stealth? We complete many of these tasks in plain view of all Hawk's guests. If you take the balcony entrance to break into his bedroom, you fire guns or knock the guards off the edge, and they scream for 30 seconds straight. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about crushing your delusions, Joe, but someone has to snap you back to reality. Besides, you've still got Jack. That's true, Jack is better than Kasumi anyway. If we've all made up, after you disable security, you get into Hawk's vault, filled with tons of references to other media. You've got an ogre from Dragon Age Origin, the head of the Statue of Liberty, which references the scene from Planet of the Apes from 1968, to name a couple. The real amazing find in this mission is the legendary M12 Casa Locust. The GOAT weapon, if you're playing Sentinel, Adept, and Engineer. Once you find the gray box, Hawk's big head shows up looking like Zordon from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, and he starts running his mouth. You can stop him by shooting some artwork, starting the combat. The music goes hard here, but the combat is pretty standard, ending in a boss fights against Hawk in a helicopter, a rather one-note fight. But the cutscene does a lot of heavy lifting here. Kasumi shows off her ninja skill by jumping onto the helicopter, and disabling its shield from close range. After defeating Hawk, we leave and learn from a recording of Keiji that the information in the gray box could start a war and that he wants us to destroy the data along with all his memories of Kasumi. Kasumi wants to hold on to it, so we have a choice. Let her keep it or destroy it ourselves. Kind of pointless. Kasumi pieces the data back together in Mass Effect 3, so it comes down to whether you want Kasumi to stay attached to a recording of her dead boyfriend. I delete them out of spite. Unfortunately, I will say it goes in C tier. 
As enjoyable as Kasumi is, her mission doesn't match up to B tier due to her status as a DLC character. There's no central story importance, and there isn't much change for Kasumi in the future. Now we're going to move on to the DLC mission.